Uh, well, good evening. Welcome to the British Library. Thank you very much for being here. So many of you, it's lovely to see back in our newly reopened Knowledge Centre, Pigot Theatre. And a very warm welcome to those of you who are watching online for wherever you may be around the world, both through our own uh, British Library player and also through Intelligence Squared. We're delighted to be partnering with them on this live stream. So tonight, we're obviously delighted to welcome Simon Sharma, introducing his hot off the press new book foreign bodies which we'll be hearing all about during the evening um, there are copies for, as you many of you will have already seen and snapped up copies of the book outside in the foyer to, to to be bought and those of you who are watching online there's a tab at the top of your screen saying books and you can go there and that will enable you to buy a book as well from the british library shop um, we are taking questions after about 50 minutes and there those of you watching online have the opportunity to ask questions too below the video window you'll see a form you can post a question in there and we'll read out some of those uh, later on that's about it but obviously I need to introduce our host for tonight Kavita Puri who is uh, an award-winning journalist uh, broadcaster and writer um, her book uh, Partition Voices Untold British Stories was based on her claimed Radio 4 series of the same name uh, it won the series won a Royal Historical Society Prize and a also uh, a public history prize um yeah world historical public history prize sorry uh, and um her book was also then adapted as a stage production at the donmar so you're in great hands both with kavita and with sir simon Chama. thank you Hello all and welcome and welcome to those who are joining us online. Simon Sharma needs very little introduction. He's the Professor of Art History and History at Columbia University in New York. He's the author of many books including Citizens, Landscape and Memory and the Power of Art. And he's presented landmark series on the BBC including A History of Britain, Civilizations, and most recently, The Excellent History of Now. Um, I just found out, actually, Foreign Bodies isn't even out yet. It's out next Thursday. And this is Simon's first public event talking about the book, so we're very... So I'm lucky. very scared. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and the funny thing is, actually, round the corner, March 2020, just before lockdown, Simon was the last person I had a drink with. And we were with a friend of yours who's a doctor. Yeah. And as we went to leave, he said, don't hug. <laughs> and we were just like, I, you know. Did, do you guess, it, did I obey that? <laughs> and no. We, we thought, well, maybe a little, a little overreaction. And at, at, little did I know, actually, that would be the last drink I would have with a friend in a really, really long time, because really soon after we went into lockdown. But when we were at that drink, you were definitely not talking about no. writing about pandemics or vaccines or the health of nations. No, I wasn't. So, so tell us, what happened in between? Well, <laughs> 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 yeah. Um, well, I, you know, it, it happened in a very... There's no way to explain to, every, to all of you, really, except um, in a rather serpentine manner. What a shocker, right? And um, I, I was then actually working on a book about nationalism, um, and particularly about, you know, as I, about the, what I call loosely the culture of nationalism. Um, in other words, the way music, for example, in the 19th century um, became obsessed with expressing national identity. I was thinking of Glinka in Russia and Sibelius much later on and Elgar and so on. So I was, I, and, and there was there was a chapter on plan, chapter on sport, and even chapter on food and so on. And this, you know, it was, it, it's remained whether we like it or not, and on the whole, I don't like it. Um, a, a very important subject. It was called Return of the Tribes because I remember my history teacher at school. I can't remember if I've told you this story, Kavita, but um, so we're in 1958, I would guess a brilliant teacher called Ian Lister at Haberdasher School um, in what was, used to grandly call itself Hampstead. In fact, it was the slummiest part of Crickleball, which made us all <laughs> love it fabulously. And he said, well, boys, he said, um, I don't know what the rest of the, frankly, you know, we're not in a prophesying business. And this is a passable version of Ian's voice, I think. He'll forgive me if he's not here. Um, he said, but I don't know what the rest of the 20th century has, but one thing we know for sure, 
organised religion and nationalism are dead as dodos. <laughs> you know, so much indeed for the prophetic power of historians. Uh, so the return of all this, you know, is, is a, a real phenomenon. And, um, and as I was sort of working and researching, there was also a chapter, I, I spent bits of time in Kosovo on the kind of perversion of history by the likes of Slobodan Milosevic. And um, I was thinking, well, this is all incredibly... A, I kind of know this subject already, and B, it's sort of depressing. And there has to be some sort of redeeming. And I thought, well... You know, because actually, when I got back, you know, it, indeed the pandemic hit, and I thought, well, the founding of the World Health Organization, and indeed the way societies and nations ought to be behaving now, even in their own self-interest, because viruses and bacteria are no respecters of frontiers in a world connected by transport, by, by airlines and, and everything else. Um, this is bound to be a moment... Um, when national self-interest comes second to global self-interest as the motto of the COVAX scheme meant to sh distribute shared vaccines, buy up stocks of vaccines which could be given to the relatively poor part of the world was no one is safe until everyone is safe. So I thought, oh, well, you know, it, it's, this is one moment where, you know, how naive could I possibly be? This did not turn out to be the case. Countries that could afford to put down large sums of cash, including our own, bought up advanced stocks, while Sarah Gilbert and her lab in Oxford at AstraZeneca were just barely beginning to develop and had a very general idea of when a vaccine would, would, um, would be successfully achieved, much less distributed. And the low point for me, when I realised how naive that was... Um, was when Boris Johnson's government, possibly him or I can't remember Matt Hancock, remember him, um, <laughs> um, was, was um, I think it was Matt Hancock there, withdrew from the European early warning. Uh, it, there's a pool of information about pandemic early warning, which the EU set up and which uh, they made clear um, would not be affected by a Brexit vote or by you know, Britain's position via the EU, namely exiting from it. And in order to sort of not possibly be vulnerable to criticisms that you're still part of the European Union, at the start of the pandemic, we decided to withdraw from any future warning pool of scientific and epidemiological information. I thought, this is truly awful. So I, I started to think, my wife is a biologist, retired now, but she's a, a, a geneticist wor working on cell differentiation in early implanted embryos. And, um, and so, you know, science is talked a lot in our, in our house. And I, I said I'm sort of getting really interested in not only our present perplexity, but in, you know, the way history might have something to say about earlier pandemics and epidemics. And, you know, and... So I said, you know very well your husband has a horrific, horrible case of imposter syndrome. You know, how much more of an imposter can he possibly be? And <laughs> she said, well, I'll read the manuscript, you know, if there, if there is one, which she did, bless her. Thank you, Ginny. And um, so, so I, I, got more, I got more and more interested. And there was a, there was a turning point. Um, when I went to, I thought, well, the founding, looking desperately for a kind of redemptive moment when my slightly more, you know, expansive and optimistic, as you know, Kavita, I'm a kind of glass half full person, um, you know, looking for something. I thought, OK, go to the founding of the World Health Organization in 1948 in San Francisco when the UN was being set up. It was the first specialised agency. And that um, it had turned out to online, everything had to be online, obviously, um, and so much of my research was made available at archives online, um, revealed an extraordinary thing to me, um, something called the International Sanitary Conferences, which play a big part in the book, were founded first in 1851 to deal with cholera, um, when in the aftermath of, in the, there were two horrific outbreaks in this country as well as in France, well, actually, more than two. The first one was 1817, then was a very big one in 1832, and then another very big one, 1848-49, which was traced to the notorious Broad Street pump in, in Soho by incredible 
forensic work of, of John Snow. And um, in 1851, it was, it was sort of already known by some of the more forthright and, and you know, clear-sighted scientists. This is before anybody had ever seen a virus or a, ba a bacillus or a bacterial pathogen under a microscope. Well, and when I say before, actually, the, the first person who did see um, uh, a pathogen under a microscope was also in 1851, a man called Filippo Pacini, and it, he never got any credit for it. It was thought to be so far-fetched. But in 1851, this organization, it's the first organiza international organization which was not a military alliance and, and not a peace conference, and it was for global public health. It was trying to you know, to sort of surmount national and imperial barriers in, um, well, Sharma talks so long, the lights close. Is <laughs> it funny? Sort of like, like a pub, you know. Uh, will you now please shut up, you know, so. Uh, I'm famous for leaving my audience in the dark, you know, actually. It is. <laughs> oh, it's Thank all right, you. they forgive you. Mehr, mehr Licht, which is the last thing Goethe said before he died, as you, as you all know. So, um, what I was reading the accounts of these conferences, and he showed up. And this is Marcel Proust's father, Adrian Proust. And I knew a little bit about I knew he was a doctor, which he was. I didn't know he was an epidemiologist, turned epidemiologist, published on many, many things, on diseases of the brain, diseases of the, he was an incredible medical polymath on diseases of the lung. But he became a great mover and shaker, trying to... His, his was really one of the very earliest vision. It wasn't the first, but he was the second person to say, really, the future of the world is always going to be in peril unless there is an international public health agency. It took him until 1903, the year he died, actually, to get a more general agreement on this. And he was, you know, not particularly saintly. I mean, he, he understood that even though cholera arose from fecally contaminated water, it is quite extraordinary, given the state of our rivers and mm. so on, that actually, I mean, I'm amazed that we actually don't have cholera in Britain now, and I will not be surprised when we do, um, despite the fact that Damien Green told us he was fantastically happy as a child <laughs> swimming amidst turds, you know, really. For, takes one to know one, I suppose. You know, yeah. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> Oops, <laughs> we're streaming, as it were. Uh, yeah, so Kavita's so, giving me that look, which says, "You shouldn't, so, you shouldn't have said that, and I shouldn't be here if you do it, do it again." So let's, anyway, let's, here is Adrian Proust. So. so, but there were other signs. So you're milling around in your home in New York. It's kind of yeah. locked down, and you come across a book that you picked up in, I do, in Paris. I do, and here it is. Oh, uh, here it is. Yes, this is extraordinary because, as I said, I knew I'd always thought of Adrian Proust as a sort of figure of fun, you know, as pompous as Marcel, whatever his imperfections were, was not. And there's an extraordinary story about his father being um, believed. I mean, his father was a, a great medic in a way, but he, like countless others, believed that masturbation would kill you in various ways, or really. Um, and so he sent Marcel to a brothel um, with, with money, and this wasn't going to work out, you know, Marcel being phenomenally gay at an early age. And however, Marcel tried to go through with it, and he was, what was he? He, he, he sort of kicked over a, a water jug or something and broke it. Wasn't he very young? He was 12, yeah. No, 14, 14, I think, 14. Anyway, it was, it was not a good thing. So I, I thought this was terrible, old, pompous, dreadful martinet, which he, it was none of those things. And I do remember that actually years, years ago, 15, 20 years ago, I bought this little tiny book about Adrian, which I'd started to read and then just, I don't know, it disappeared. And um, it was an éloge. It was, it was published by his son, Robert, who was a urologist, very successful, and gynaecologist in Paris. Um, so Proust had a younger brother who was a doctor and, and a friend called, um, uh, who together went on a kind of journey back to the village, the, the small town that Proust calls Cambrai, which is actually a village called Ilie. And... Um, and so I went back to this, and in one of these extraordinary moments of weird, spooky serendipity, 
the little booklet fell open at this page, which is about the funeral of Adrien Proust, where Le Tout Paris came, and this extraordinary dried sprig of hawthorn. And any of you who've read, uh, you know, got as far as reading volume one, Swan's Way, Côté de chez Swan, will know that the hawthorn was incredibly significant for Proust. It was, there were, there were uh, uh, branches of it in a church, and the scent of hawthorn switched on Proust's sort of sensory wiring in a way he describes ecstatically. And I thought, whoa, this is a sign from, you know, spooky writer's place somewhere out there, actually. And, um, and I started to think about, actually, the relationship between national and international politics and how we, how we deal under conditions of extreme stress and fear with, with epidemics and pandemics. And I think the heart of your book, whether you're talking about smallpox or cholera or plague, is this paradox that yeah. humans are capable of incredible ingenuity, but equally primitive irrationality. And yeah. it comes up time and time again. Yeah. The reason that is exactly, and I realise that you know a lot of what I've written over many, many books, actually, kind of turns on that. My book about you know, the French Revolution is really about a phenomenon which ought to have been a consummation of Enlightenment philosophy, really, of Montesquieu and Rousseau, insofar as they can be reconciled, but turns into a kind of nightmare of mad theatrical violence, some licensed by the state, some not licensed by the state. And I sort of, I guess, with this book, I've come to realise, you know, in a kind of duh sort of way, that we think of, because history books are, you know, often organised in stages, mm. really, that you've got your enlightenment, and then something doesn't quite work out as expected, and then you've got your romantic nationalism. But that's actually not true. You know, the, the books, the founding formative texts about German nationalism, for example, by... Johann Gottfried Herder, for example, are published in the 1760s, around exactly the same time as Rousseau and, and Diderot and the Encyclopédie. So these kind of extraordinary terrible twins, which march together into modernity, uh, um, scientific, analytical science and empirically acquired knowledge, and uh, uh, upholding as utterly authentic to human behavior, impulse and instinct, and therefore, while not necessarily being delighted by it, accepting it's part of what it's like to be a human being, to be irrational and hysterical and paranoid and the subject of nightmares. And this has gone on and on. And that's why, you know, my wonderful history teacher was was wrong because really the Enlightenment vision was that one day as science and education progress, um, poverty and superstition, particularly religious superstition, um, and horrible disease will vanish from the face of the earth. And all the time, this sort of, you know, gremlin world of the other dark side of our natural instinct, of our wiring, was going straight ahead. And could, what is surprising and incredibly depressing is how much it continues to be the case now. Mm. You know, there are, uh, uh, as we said, there, there are, there's a Democratic candidate, you all may have noticed this, by the name of Robert Kennedy Jr., that family, who's running as an anti-vaccine presidential candidate mm. for the Democratic Party. And he's getting, and I thought this was an unelectable joke, but actually I was told by the New York Times correspondent in London, far from being a joke, Susan Sarandon, for what that's worth or not, has sort of basically endorsed him. And, and money and celebrity are kind of flowing towards him. Mm. And then as a Republican, you know, Ron DeSantis makes much of saying, what do the scientists know? They got it all wrong about vaccines and lockdown and masks and so on. So this sort of sense in which an extreme moment in our you know, collective history, both environmental and biomedical, was still fighting that fight between the two halves of our consciousness. Well, and this is a book really about that. And we'll come to that um, and that kind of where that leaves us now. But I want to go back to smallpox, which right. is 
the first account of successful mm. inoculation, but God forbid it came from the Ottoman Empire. Um, and yeah. what is so interesting was the origins of that was quite... Yeah. It, it was very problematic, wasn't it? Because it was upturning assumptions within Christian Europe yeah. uh, that, that you could learn from the East. Yeah, it was, it, it was astonishing. The, the, the book, um, the narrative proper of, of Foreign Bodies begins with a terrifying... Um, attack of smallpox, which Voltaire went through and very nearly killed him. Um, and it's Voltaire who writes the first essay meant for a, a popular readership in the so-called Lettre Philosophique, which actually comes out first in English. Voltaire was in England, 1726-7, but it comes out in 1733 as letters concerning the English nation. It's very flattering to, to us. Um, in a kind of um, very invidious comparison with, with the French. Not, as a result, the book was instantly burned by the public hangman in Paris, of course. <laughs> Saw losers, you know. Um, and Voltaire noticed that he'd picked up from a pool of information um, this extraordinary phenomenon, which was seen by this woman, Lady Mary Wortley Montague, the wife of Edward Wortley Montague, the British ambassador to Constantinople in, in 1716, 1718, that uh, women in the Sultan's harem in the Seraglio, um, but not just women in the Sultan, she noticed it when she was in Adrianople and indeed in Sofia on her way, they were both on their way to take up the position at the embassy, that women were astonishingly completely without the disfigurement and scars of smallpox attacks. And at that time, Smallpox was killing, killing one in six people who caught it. And Mary Wortley Montague herself had had a terrible attack, and, which, and she was a had been a famous beauty. And her face was just cratered with smallpox scars. And she lost, famously, she lost her eyelashes altogether, which, you know, sounds like a small thing, but obviously is a terrible thing, really, in a way. And um, she, so she discovers this. She was not the first to notice this. Um, and there were two remarkable physicians, one called Emanuele Timoni and the other one called Giacomo Pilarini, although I'm giving them their Italian names, and they both had Italian associations, but they were Greek. One was from um, Chios, and the other one was from Help Cephalonia. Um, and like many other physicians in that larger Ottoman Empire, they were... Timoni was also a translator. He came from a family of dragomans, of official interpreters. That many of these people who were commercial agents were also physicians and translators and extraordinary virtuosi. And it was they who first sent reports that in the Ottoman Empire, mostly as a result of practice not by Muslims, but by elderly Greek Christian ladies, of this extraordinary thing, that you take a bit of pus in other words, you take the horrible, disgusting matter of, that would kill you um, and you inject it into your arms. And it not only does not kill you, it also protects you from disfigurement if you happen to survive. That the scabs will be far fewer and they drop off. And, you know, to children, and particularly um, in, in that Greco-Oriental word, to female children, whom it was thought the marriage, pro correctly, marriage prospects would disappear if they went like, Larry like Lady Mary Wortley Montague from beautiful to not beautiful. Um, and it was sort of a celebrated folk custom. And the astonishing thing, Kavita, to me, I mean, one of the many big surprises was that their reports were sent to the Royal Society. So we're now around 1714, 15, 16, that very, very early on in the 18th century and were treated with the utmost seriousness. So this was an absolute reversal of what we think of as the imperial mentality. The Royal Society, since it had been founded under Charles II in the 1660s, had been in the business of saying, we are the heirs of Francis Bacon, we are going to sweep away dreadful folk medicine and folk wisdom and folk practice with the fruits of hard-earned, empirically acquired knowledge. Um, and they were uh, undoubtedly impressed by that, and more reports came in. And, of course, there were divisions. Um, 
But they, they then set about to try and understand, again, not having a clue about pathogenesis. Uh, this, but it was, they accepted that it was demonstrably true that this... So it had to have Brits and Europeans, in, and not just in, in Turkey, but in Syria, in North Africa, um, but in a world which was supposed to be barbaric and decayed and degenerate, being a lifesaver. If you were inoculate, this is 100 years before Jenna, so this is human inoculation. Um, uh, and Lucy Ward, by the way, you're not here, are you, Lucy? Anyway, Lucy Ward has written a wonderful book about a doctor called Thomas Dimsdale, who go, put, goes to Russia and persuades Catherine the Great to inoculate herself. And, and um, many, both aristocrats and non-aristocrats in Russia, it's a great book, re highly recommend it. Um, but, um, you know, it was, it's such a counterintuitive thing to do, but your odds, I was going to say, the odds of dying or being horribly disfigured dropped from one in six to one in 50. You know, so Voltaire, who'd survived, you know, then became a campaigner for this. And Mary does an extraordinary thing. She actually inoculates her six-year-old boy in Constantinople. Um, not the first English person to inoculate, but certainly the first mother to, to do this. And, and not only she, does she do this, she does it actually when Edward is away with the Sultan in, in Edirne, in Adrianople. And um, it, it's quite clear she chose her timing. She was helped by Emmanuel Timoni to find one of these Greek ladies who did the inoculation. But she also had the embassy surgeon, a, a, a Scotsman practicing in England called Charles Maitland, be there. And he said, the Greek woman, he complained that she did it so roughly that the boy cried and cried and he had to take over the job, true or not, not, not sure. But she becomes, when she goes back to England, because the embassy sort of fails in what it was supposed to do, um, it can't be my mother complaining about me. <laughs> but it might be. You know, so. um, <laughs> um, when she goes back to England, she then inoculates her daughter. And here she is being painted, becomes very famous, painted by Godfrey Nella in Turkish dress. Um, but she, inoc she inoculates her, her daughter, and she decides to become a campaigner for inoculation. And Kavita and I were talking about this. Women play an extraordinary part. The, the, the part that it was very important that mothers came forward to do this ostensibly incredibly dangerous thing or risky or surprising or shocking thing. And she actually, the, first, one, the most important person she persuades is the then Princess of Wales, Caroline of Ansbach, who becomes Queen Caroline to George II when George II becomes king in 1727. So there is a kind of sort of celebrity elite mm -hmm. moment without which, and, and even so, it takes a long time, really until the 1750s, for inoculation to be accepted. And in the meantime, she, as a woman, is un particularly is under ferocious attack, particularly from the clergy, um, who say, and um, one of them called William Wagstaff preaches. You, you at, must say this quote because it's. Such yeah, a, what the one about? Um, a yes, the a practice by a few ignorant have you got women it? Yes. among an illiterate and unthinking people should be <laughs> should have a sudden and upon slender evidence be in one of the politest nations in the world. Yes, <laughs> yes. What? Well, how could you possibly? you know, take advice from, from women altogether, but particularly women in Turkey, mm. um, and who are illiterate and ignorant and so on. So this is an uh, extraordinary kind of tipping moment, actually, sort of reversing but, but, things. But you say something which I found really interesting, which was that you, you talk about Syria, Persia, the Ottoman Empire, but there were cases in Pembrokeshire and Carmarthenshire yeah. where people yeah. were, communities were inoculating Absolutely, it had been. Before this. Yeah. Um, it, it's it really only discovered by... Uh, the, the Royal Society does something extraordinary, uh, uh, quite apart from taking all this very seriously and fending off violent and violent attacks, particularly from the clergy, but not only from the clergy. Um, it starts to do serious data gathering. And one of the chapters is about a man uh, incredibly brave and determined, Dr. called Thomas Nettleton, in Halifax, um, who um, really organizes, and he does it partly himself, 
door-to-door -door inquiries about actually um, who had smallpox, um, uh, you know, whether they'd been inoculated, would they be inoculated, and so on. So a really serious exercise in mass data gathering is, is um, uh, comes about starting around 1722 and going through to the early 1730s. Um, and, um, you know, that, that goes a long way to helping. It doesn't finally clinch the case at all. What was... Now I've forgotten the first question, actually. Whales. Question. Oh, whales, thank you. Yeah, so it's <laughs> by, by... They establish links with um, apothecaries and surgeons. The medical profession at the time is divided um, in order of... And this is actually very important... It's divided in terms of um, prestige um, and authority. And physicians do not do jabs and at all beneath them. Um, surgeons, who are bloodletters and tree panners, you know, do, do the jabbing. Um, but the Royal Society then establishes, under a man called James Durin, again, who is the great statistician of the Royal Society at this time, in the 1720s, um, a, a network all around the country um, to try, simply try and get information out. In the course of that, they discover that actually in Pembrokeshire, in, in South um, West Wales in particular, there had been a folk practice time out of mind. Nobody really knew. It, it had been going on immemorially, really, where uh, um, uh, the arms of children in particular were rubbed so hard they became sore and they started to bleed rather than be and then infected matter was transferred and it was known as a kind of common practice it was later discovered this was the case in some Hebridean islands so there's no explanation for how that started or when that started but it was really so there was one fantastic story about the son of the deacon of St David's or the bishop of St David's I think who said, um, and when he was a schoolboy, when he was sort of 10 or 11, he and his mates used, used the back of a penknife, he said, to actually rub very hard and make, bring a little blood, and then, you know, someone would have gone and got, you know, a little bowl of pus. Yeah. And, um, and he said, it didn't hurt at all, and we knew we were safe. And this is so extraordinary. So again, the sort of whole hierarchy of wisdom mm. is fantastically scrambled by... That. Well, you talked a little bit about writing women back into this history, but there is a central character in this book, a fascinating character, mm. um, Valdemar Haf Hafkin. Hafkin, yes. Who is uh, a Jew from Odessa, um, and here he is. And just give us a little bit of his backstory, and then we'll talk about his journey yeah. to Paris, and then to India, where right. he did some monumental right. work. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, this is a photograph. I'm, I'm showing you um, a photograph actually taken at the height of his fame. He's briefly famous. This was taken in 1899 in a chilly summer in Oxford um, by uh, another wonderful woman who occurs very fleetingly in a book called Angelina Ackland, who was a really pioneering photographer. She actually is the first person to develop a form of colour photography anywhere, I think, actually, but certainly in Britain. And Angie, as she liked to be called. Her, she was the daughter of the uh, retired Emer the Emeritus Regis Professor of Pathology, who you can see here, called Sir Henry Atland. And they'd both come to hear Valdemar Hafke, and, and I'm doing it the wrong way around, but I'll so I'll try not to make it too confusion, confusing. They'd first um, known about um, Hafke when he came with a vaccine against cholera, in 1895 and had given a lecture to the joint colleges of physicians and surgeons in London. And they instantly known old Sir Henry had been responsible for the defence of the population of Oxford against cholera in an outbreak, I think, in the, in the outbreak in the 1850s, I believe it was 1854, something like that. And he knew immediately that this was going to work. By 1899, germ theory had been revealed, sorry, had been revealed. And he became, um, in their own words, the kind of, you know, saviour of mankind, particularly in areas of the world that were incredibly badly vulnerable to outbreaks of ferociously um, dangerous epidemics. And as you can see, he's a bit of a looker and he's a phenomenal dresser. Um, and he becomes their 
archetype. They actually, in, in, uh, they bring him down to the country house of the Acklands in Devon. And it turns out he can ride a horse, which is very good. And, um, you know, he's the perfect example of a good Jew, for, even for those who are very suspicious of Jews, because he plays not just the piano, but the violin as well. <laughs> and is shy and sweet. And it, I, I ended up living with him, actually, mm -hmm. very, very closely. And I, I know exactly how he would behave if he walked through that door and sat down and stared bemusingly at me from the front row there. And he, he is sort of, that happens when you do historical research sometimes, yeah, I mean, it happens to you too. So what they didn't know was here he is already as, as, as a good looker in Odessa um, at, um, uh, in 1884. So he's in, he's 24, he was born in 1860. And he's born to a family of Secular, not entirely secular Jews, but not not shtetl. We're not in fiddler on the roof country here. Um, Odessa was the one city in so-called Novorussia, New Russia, where Jews could uh, get an education in Russian and in the professions and in medicine. And he's at the University um, of Odessa, um, and extraordinarily, he's even though he's he's famous in, for much of his life as being quite reserved and quiet. He had a very passionate side to him. And he's among a group, a small group of Jewish students who um, organized the first armed protection of the Jewish community against pogroms. And a huge pogrom came down after the assassination of Tsar Alexander II in 1881. And he's caught with guns on him three times and thrown into prison. And he's only rescued by his doctoral supervisor, a man who became famous as so-called father of immunology, Eli Mechnikov, who's also a converted Jew. So Hafkin has this impassioned background, and um, he's in trouble constantly, and the Tsarist police open a huge dossier on his terrorist activities, in effect. It's thought, and I actually think it's probably true, that he belonged to um, Novia Zemlya, the organization which in, in St. Petersburg had actually organized the assassination. I think he had nothing to do with that himself. But anyway, he was, he was regarded as super suspicious and super dangerous. And in the end, Mechnikov, uh, who, who sprung him because he had connections in St. Petersburg, sprung him three times from prison. Um, made sure the trial was not going to, he was not to go, to go on trial for armed treason and either be sent to Siberia or executed. Um, uh, Mechnikov ends up at the, the, in, at the Pasteur Institute in its first year um, when it opened in early, uh, late 1888 and early 1889. And Hafkin, he sends for Hafkin. Hafkin had had menial jobs. He was only really kept going as a student by um, sort of pocket money, in effect, sent by his half-brother, Alexander. And he has the lowly job of being, he was a, a, a guard in the Zoology Natural History Museum in Odessa. And in Paris, nobody really wanted to hire him as a, as a, as a proper doctoral student, so he becomes an assistant librarian. But he's too clever and too resourceful and too deeply involved in, in pure research work, particularly under um, Pasteur's number two, Emile Roux, in the search for a cholera vaccine and to be entirely disregarded. And the break comes when uh, a young um, medic at the Pasteur, a young researcher at the Pasteur Institute called Alexandre Yersin, who ends up discovering the, the plague bacillus, the bubonic plague bacillus, suddenly, abruptly, leaves the Pasteur Institute and goes off to be a ship's doctor for a while in, in Southeast Asia and Vietnam. And, and young Hafkin then gets his job of preparing lectures um, for, um, for Emil Roux. It was the first microbiology course in the world, famous course. And in the archive in, in Jerusalem, um, uh, there, Hafkin, so he's, he's thinking and writing and speaking in Russian and French but he's very interested in English. An extraordinary portrait of a kind of feverishly driven young man appears. First of all, 
notebook after notebook after notebook of lab notes about setting up the experiments for the students and getting the microbiology absolutely right. At the same time, tiny notebooks in exquisite French calligraphy, passages from the novels of Honoré de Balzac mm. and letters from Edward Jenner, mm. the first vaccinator, cowpox vaccinator. So a complicated and extraordinary person. And he does, after many, many, a lengthy process, manage to produce a viable vaccine against cholera, which he tests always, as he does, on himself first, a live vaccine, a live vaccine. And you get a double dose of, I think you still do, actually, of a cholera vaccine, first, um, uh, uh, f first a so-called attenuated dose, to kind of kickstart your immune system, because Hafkin, unlike much of the medical and epidemiological world, uh, he's in the Pasteur Institute, he's with Metrikoff, understood what there, there was such a thing as the immune system. And so the attenuated dose kickstarts, and then it prepares you for the second dose of the, of the, li of the live vaccine, which is much fiercer. And he rounds up some of his Russian-French friends, some at the Institute, some not, who then submit themselves to, um, to the cholera vaccine. And it works. It works. They have a fever, um, a mild fever. They have, very, um, they have a little diarrhea, nothing very much, um, swelling. But it actually, it works as a, a, as a viable vaccine. One of the people who then gets injected is a young Englishman called Ernest Hambry Hankin, who is extremely interested in his own right. We don't have time to talk about him. But the crucial thing is that Hankin knows the British ambassador who'd been Viceroy of India. The British ambassador in Paris is a man called Viscount Dufferin, complicated figure, some swayed from liberalism to conservatism. But what Dufferin, and particularly, again, another very important woman, his wife, Harriet Dufferin, who'd started a fund prodded by Queen Victoria to create Indian women doctors, mm. because both Muslims and Hindus in India are extremely reluctant to have male doctors examine them, put it mildly. Um, so the Dufferin connection um, makes Hefkin realize that to test the cholera vaccine with randomized comparative trials, trial of a population, half of whom have got taken the vaccine and half of whom not, but who otherwise live in identical living conditions, otherwise the comparative trials obviously won't work, too many independent variables, you've got to go to Asia, where cholera is endemic in some places, so that won't work, but epidemic in other places. And so he then makes a trip to India, and his life, and really the whole world of microbiology kind of changes as, as a result of that. And there's a wonderful photograph. And it's worth pointing out, isn't it, that yeah. a photograph like this of Imperial India was hugely unusual. Incredibly rare. Um, and he used a lot of Indians in his, yeah. in his work. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's only other one... European there. Yes, um, that's a man called William Simpson behind I, him, who's, who's a very early champion of both Hafkin and of cholera vaccination. But he wasn't and, hugely supported by the authorities in, in no, Imperial he got, Britain. No, he was led time. by Dufferin. He was led by Dufferin to believe Dufferin provides, and he's, you know, the, 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 the prior viceroy. So there's a big fancy letter. Um, he goes to India in 1893. And there's a big fancy letter saying this man will change everything in India. And he absolutely ignored or worst. The Indian Medical Service, the IMS, does not want to know about microbiology. It had not happened in Britain yet. There was a tremendous amount of nose holding. The choices um, of microbiological research were Robert Koch in Berlin um, or Louis Pasteur in Paris. And there is a sort of what was extraordinary and depressing, and goes back to what I was saying earlier about, you know, um, stroking my chin in a broody way about how nationalism had overcome a, a sensible response to the COVID pandemic. What's going on is a kind of incredible uh, imperialist um, game of actually um, ha whether one empire or another empire deals better with this 
um, misfortune that your imperial copybook is blotted by outbreaks of, mm. um, of epidemics. As Kavita tells me, she's working on... No, 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 no. She's not working on anything. She's just... No, 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 no. Just, just here to pull me up short. OK, because it's bad luck and we're not supposed to know. But, anyway, but, that, but, but the, the important... I just want to make one point, is that... We're in, a, we're in the 1890s, we're in a very, we're not quite at the, uh, at the vice royalty of, of Curzon, but we're nearly there. Um, the, the Indian nationalist movement is beginning in a very sort of almost demure, careful, gradualist, constitutionalist way in India. Um, and it, there's a huge pushback against it by particularly conservative viceroys at the end of the... And what they're saying is that um, this nationalism is just, Indian nationalism is just a lot of noise coming from over-educated lawyers and professors and writers. The, the Indian masses, no, not interested in political rights. They're interested in a better material life. And whatever you want to say about the Raj, it looks after the material and physical needs of Indians. And it says this as, as people are dropping dead in millions from terrible famines and are not being looked after very well when an epidemic of cholera and then another huge wave of bubonic plague arrives in 1896. So Hafkin, their response to dealing with both cholera and bubonic plague um, is to say, we need to mount a kind of military campaign of disinfection. A chapter of the book is called Carbolic because it's kind of cult of carbolic acid, really. And what you do is, with the infected populations, you find who is contagious and you send them to disinfection camps or plague or disinfection hospitals, sluice them with carbolic, keep them away. And this was an absolutely indiscriminate thing. And while cholera, of course, was subject to insanitary conditions, because these quasi-military campaigns, let's go on, we can come back to um, that. Oh, there we are. Um, yeah. Um, there you can see, actually, a scene from an extraordinary album called the Plague Visitation Album. And you can see a column of Sikh soldiers on the right. There are authorised uh, magistrates on the left. And their job is really to go around the houses. This is... Um, this is in Mumbai, in Bombay. And if, if somebody was being hidden or discovered to have been infected with bubonic plague, you, 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 um, you lime washed and disinfected the house, or you might, you might just tear it down altogether. You might sort of flatten it. This is called letting air in. Um, <laughs> it's a fairly terminal way of letting air, air in. Um, and so to actually say... Um, if you will be prepared to learn the elements, rudiments of microbiology, you'll know in the case of bubonic plague in particular that any amount of disinfection, because this is a bacillus which is carried by a flea, as Yasan had discovered in Hong Kong, and is on the bodies of rats, and the rats will simply leave in very large numbers and go somewhere else and carry the disease with them. And there is vaccination, which Hafkin develops and creates in India. And he's just put, he's given no money, he's given no lab space. Um, the only person who comes to his aid, apart from William Simpson, you see there in the middle, um, and his eager and eager Indian assistants, who are um, kind of minor Indian medical officials in Calcutta. Um, apart from those, is Hankin, who has, is allowed to have um, a medical establishment in Agra. Um, and so Hafkin gets equipment and supplies and trains people. And then, well now, sorry, back in, with cholera in 1890, um, late 1893, 1894, and early, early 1895, he undertakes extraordinary kind of odyssey, uh, thousands of miles by train, by boat, by horse, by mule, vaccinating only volunteers, but also, very importantly, vaccinating um, comparative trials. So hospitals, prisons, barracks, where um, every other person is vaccinated. This is not without its suffering, because particularly during the plague vaccine, um, if you were 
you know, number two in the row and you were not going to be vaccinated, so a comparative trial would be tested, you were pretty upset. And there were moments where Hafkin thinks, I have to go back and vaccinate everybody. That happens particularly at a, a particular prison. So it is just astonishing. But what I found really remarkable is the sheer numbers of people he yeah. vaccinates. I mean, yeah. that first year he's vaccinating 22,000 people. And it's yeah. worth saying, you say they're volunteers, they were Indian troops, but they were people who were often disregarded by the authorities. Yeah, this is a slum, actually. This slum is a dwellers, tea this, It looks like a village. The lower caste. That's it was, right. You know, people who were that's always right. neglected. Yeah, that's um, right. But I, we don't have much time, so I, we're, oh. we're, we're in 1893. Oh, my God, we don't. Um, <laughs> Help. And so he's... He, Do I talk too much? Yeah. Probably, yeah. Um, so, so we're at this place... Most the, rhetorical the, the British, question ever, um, really. the, the British are not having much regard for him, but they realise all these people are dying, and actually yeah. they're looking at his data, and they think yeah. there's something in it. Right. And they they allow him to become di director of this new institute. Yeah. It's really... Uh, uh, remember that first photograph taken by, um, uh, by Angelina Ackland? Um, he, is, he is enormously appreciated in Britain, and one of the people who's the biggest fan is Lord Lister, it's Joseph Lister. So on the strength of that, even though the Indian Medical Service is extremely uncomfortable with him, they do let him set up... Oh, there he is. So there he is. That's just an extraordinary photo. I mean, that is not in the kind of album of Imperial. There he is on a street vaccinating again someone who's come forward as a volunteer. Or, I mean, they've asked him, you know, they haven't... I love uh, the way well, he always dressed up for vaccination. Yeah, he is just, yeah... Um, yeah, he is a tr he's both a hero and a sort of terrible dandy in a way. So he is dressed up to the nines. But one, um, this figure here you just see behind the figure in the pith helmet is an extraordinary woman who, you'll have to read the book called Alice Courthorn, um, who is, again, absolutely a remarkable um, woman doctor on the first generation. It's extraordinary how... These very brave, determined, brilliantly clever women, actually, were determined to go into the heart of sickness and poverty. And Alice holds the records. Hafkin tells us that no one came close. She works in a very badly infected town called Dabanga in Bihar. And she vaccinates a 1,000 people a day. And um, we have a... It's a little blurry, but it's one of the photo. There's Alice in her vaccination buggy, um, actually about to go on her rounds to the houses of this very... Um, and she, rather wonderfully, she, she's also um, an amazingly clever research scientist in her own right. And at one point where she saw dead animals, particularly, and birds, but particularly monkeys dropping from trees, she, un she was one of the first people to understand what we call zoonotic diseases, the relationship between the transmission of um, serious pathogens from animal populations to human populations. So here's, here's, this was Government House in Bombay, um, a place called Perel, still is called that. In fact, the Hafkin Institute is here. Um, now, not a, more of a kind of a museum, still works on snake venom, which is very important, anti -snake, antidotes to snake venom. This is in Perel. This is the incubation room of the so-called Plague Research Laboratory, which starts operating in August 1899, and with only 53 people. So as I say, a result of this British admiration, really, he's in a position to be able to hire 50, just 50-odd 50 people. He wants to actually have 700 or so. He never gets that. But with this very, very limited number of people producing the vaccine, the anti-plague vaccine, bottling it, incubating it, he gets out some 10,000 doses a day, mm. which then goes up to 90,000 doses a day. And the number of staff working at Perel goes up to, I estimated very roughly, just from looking at photographs of the entirety of the staff, 200, the overwhelming number of whom are Indians. In fact, there are four very important senior physician scientists at Perel. And, and uh, the, the plague vaccine is not only incredibly successful, demonstrably, statistically successful, in a very frightening epidemic, plague, we've all forgotten this, plague actually kills 
in the end, nearly 20 million people before it finally dies out, this fifth pandemic, so-called, dies out in the, in the 1920s, when, particularly when certain kinds of antibiotics are produced, like streptomycin. So um, it's also exported to Australia, to China, to Indonesia, um, and, you know, so it's an astonishing... It's the first mass production facility in the world. just before we run out of time, I want to end yeah. the story of, of Hafkeen because yeah. it's such a sad yeah. story and it all goes horribly, horribly it wrong does, for him yeah, in a yeah. Punjabi village and it he does. gets wrongfully blamed. And I'm forwarding here because it right. happens to him. It's like a medical version of the Dreyfus affair. It is. And he never recovers. I imagine he was... He was completely heartbroken by yes, what happened to him. He very evidently is. Um, he, he, 17 people die, was it 19? I, uh, I think it's 19 people die of tetanus poisoning from a single contaminated batch coming out of Perel, coming out of, in Malkawal, indeed, as Kavita says in the Punjab. And so I feel um, people are, it, it eventually turns out to be the case that what had happened. Um, in bref, as the French say, is that actually one of the preparers of the vaccine in the village, and they were always done, because they're done in rural, you know, Hafkin did not want this to be, you know, he wanted vaccination for everybody, for, for very poor people. So it was done in open fields, and this was done in an open field. And the preparer of the vaccine had actually dropped the forceps, which was used to remove the stopper, which had an Indian rubber band neck around it. And uh, Hafkin had, had, had prepared a little blue book telling people absolutely um, uh, you know, how to work in the field with a plague vaccine. And what would happen if by any chance there'd be the remotest possibility of contamination. And what you had to do was pass the, um, the contaminated object or the bottle head through flame, through a spirit flame, very high spirit flame. But this particular preparer did not do that. He just washed it in a solution of carbolic acid, which did not do the trick. None of this was known at the time of this catastrophe. And he was immediately suspended from his job. Um, he was then fired. This happened in 1902. He was, he was fired officially in 1900, end of 1903. He, he was made to leave. He came to London um, to sort of... Because there were two things... I know I'm going on a bit, but there were, that he knew without knowing, without getting the report of what had actually happened, he knew there was something very fishy about he could not possibly have been responsible because actually um, for, in other words, contaminating the batch at source, at its production source, because it got two or three weeks before it got to the Punjab at least... And if the growth of toxin had started in Bombay, a very strong odour, an unmistakable head-snapping odour would have escaped, and that had not been the case. That the, the, um, the officer administering the vaccine said no, there was no odour. So it made kind of no sense to him. But there were two commissions of inquiry, both of which blamed him. And his, his career was completely broken. He was in utter disgrace. Until um, uh, a man called Ronald Ross. I, was, I hesitated because I thought, mm, this is going to be a spoiler and you want to find out. But I will, you know, a, an extraordinary man who was responsible for making the, demonstrating the connection between Anopheles mosquitoes and malaria, called Ronald Ross, um, was approached by William Simpson, who you saw in that photo of Hafkin um, inoculating the Indians in the Calcutta Busti. And Ross, who was a maverick himself and had fought against the medical establishment in India, knew something was really a, a terrible miscarriage of medical justice, hence being like Dreyfus. And Ross and Simpson together, the Hafkin was so overwhelmed, very emotionally grateful, living in his little room in the St. Ermin's Hotel. Um, they led an incredible campaign it, so the, the Lancet, the British Medical Journal, the Times, they gathered 
molecular, bio not molecular biologists, microbiologists from America as well as from Britain, and led a storming campaign, and eventually the government was forced to release all the documents which showed exactly what actually had happened in the Punjab village. And uh, the government became very, then liberal government, very shifty, but eventually it was a public vindication of Hafkin. But he was by then, he'd lost his, you know, he was given a job back in India um, in 1908, uh, but he was, he was kept away from vaccines. He was no longer trusted. Um, he wrote this heartbreaking letter saying, it's just like it was before you mounted the campaign. Nothing has changed. And um, his, his life as a great scientist was really over. This final photo, which I was so moved by, found again, in the boxes of his papers in, in Jerusalem, um, is, is taken in 1908. And it's at a coal mine in Jaria, northeast of Calcutta, about 100, 200 kilometers north of Calcutta, northeast. And an outbreak of cholera, not plague, had broken out in June, I think it was, of 1908. And, and there were terrible accounts of people dying on the road and wild dogs eating human remains and bringing pieces of arm and leg into people's houses and no one being prepared to bury the dead. And Hafkin was so upset and distressed. He volunteered and, and he was met with a very frosty resistance again by the official British medical authorities. But he goes to his old students in Calcutta and Bombay and gathers enough vaccination material. He's very concerned that it will go off, it will expire, and he was very nervous about this. And the owners of the mines, for selfish, you know, for, but rational reason, reasons, wanted the miners who hadn't fled to be inoculated against cholera, and the miners themselves were absolutely desperate to be inoculated against cholera. Again, it was cutting huge sway through their, their community. And we have this final photo of him as a vaccinator. And as you can see, it's a double, sort of double exposure. That's to say, the inspector of the mines, medical inspector, took the photo and was clearly not a hotshot photographer, hadn't figured out shutter speed and things like that. So it's caught him in two modes. I hope you can see it. It's beautifully reproduced in the book. On the one hand, he's, he's at work looking down very carefully, because he was very nervous and anxious about this, at the arm of the volunteer miner he's inoculating. On the other hand, he's looking directly back at us with this sort of serious, upset, worried, slightly angry look. And I say in the, um, oh, we didn't do a little reading, did we? Um, I say at the end of the book, we'll never know which came first, actually, whether or not he, is, he, he poses reluctantly for this official, you know, this mines photographer and then gets back to work, so like, or whether he's working and doesn't want to be disturbed and the photographer takes a picture of him in media race working and then he reluctantly says, fine. Um, and it was sort of, it's heartbreaking really in a way, not just about him because there is a sense in, in his dark years that there is only so much science can do. Yeah. When you meet with these, as Ross shared this view, dug in numbskulls of official, bureaucratic, obscurantist, reactionary, do it by the book. You know, the computer says no. You know, that sort of thing. So it was moving for that reason. But I have to say, I found quite moving a postscript, which is um, the Indian Covivax, the first vaccine that they had, was made at the Hafkeem Institute. Yeah. And so he That's is right. remembered That's right. in India. Uh, and he he is remembered. India is the only place yeah. he's remembered. I was astonished that, that he becomes very, having not been much interested in Judaism, he becomes very religious towards the, at, at this period. And um, he gives his papers. That's why I put the National Library of Israel in Jerusalem. But, um, but it's extraordinary that he's not really known in Israel at all, actually, or pretty much anywhere. I mean, um, wonderful people at the Welcome Collection knew about him a bit. But, yeah. But I, he has, you know, important institutes named after him. and well, No, um, only, think, why, only no, the one in India, in Bombay, in but Mumbai. I, 
I don't know. I, fa I found it quite moving that India does remember him. And yeah, I it think does. he saved it does. thousands and maybe millions of lives there. Yeah. Um, I would love questions um, uh, from you, and I know we'll have some online questions after, as well from our audience who are watching around the world. Um, so please put your hand up. Thanks. Um, initially, uh, thank you very much, uh, Sir Sharma. It's a privilege and an honor for this opportunity. So, generally, thank you very much. Um, my, my question concerns the nature of pathology, um, both in terms of the past and in modernity, and um, how traditionally each society has approached uh, both the identification and or appraisal of disease states um, across a population. So that, that is, um, as you mentioned, um, epidemiologically. Mm -hmm. um, um, the etiology, its origins, and the remedial practices to address these concerns. Um, with, with great respect towards the medical establishment, there seems to be an emphasis placed upon uh, medical practitioners um, to treat disease retrospectively, um, a sort of a post-occurrence where there may be a risk of an almost sort of anthropic or sapiential sort of hubris of being separate from the natural world, um, favoring a reliance upon technology whilst ignoring the lessons gleaned from biology. Um, sorry, now with a greater consideration towards homeopathy, either working with or antithetically to the sort of dominant allopathic practices, do you think there is um, too great an emphasis placed upon the study of disease as opposed to the cultivation of well-being, uh, where one may be reactive and the other potentially more proactive? And um, do you think there are lessons ha to shape the future accordingly? And where, where, is your, where do you think, um, in your opinion, is that balance? Well, I'm not, well <laughs> so a small question. Sorry, apologies. <laughs> Sorry, apologies. <laughs> no, it's right. are, you, are, you, are you a medical student or are you a practice? Um, I'm, I'm an enthusiast. So I'm actually an artist, but... Um, <laughs> 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 so, I mean, I, I say... You I don't well, then, yeah, it would be, uh, you know, uh, as I said, um, my sense of uh, imposter syndrome would be massively magnified if I even, you know began to give you an authoritative response to that. I, what I would say to you, and it's genuinely a very interesting question, is that what is very striking um, uh, in the 18th century, dealing with smallpox, uh, particularly the second generation, um, is that the issues actually... Um, because they, they, you know, they, 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 there is a battle going on, crucially, which I, I think you'll probably know about, about whether um, either play, but more particularly smallpox, is imminent inside the body. It's kind of waiting for something to trigger it. Or whether it was conceivable that it was generated from some sort of external organism. And the vast, the massive consensus laid down in particular by a very, very popular um, medical writer called Thomas Sydenham in the late 17th century was that smallpox was it was the former view, the wrong view, that smallpox came about as a result of the ill adjustment of the humours and was a way, it was actually a salutary process of taking you from one stage of the imbalance of humours to a better balance of them. So it was a kind of some one said them, I think, called it a salutary refreshment, except it killed one in six people. <laughs> They're not that salutary, really. Um, but the, the, a lot of the literature about it, particularly as more knowledge is acquired about smallpox without having a clue about germ theory yet, um, exactly turns, it, as, as we said, it's very interested in cultures um, which have practice, I suppose, what we call homeopathy. For example, the most extraordinary thing I just, I just discovered, didn't, you know, must be known to other people, but it's not been noted. The man who wrote the famous book on the black hole of Calcutta, John Zephaniah Holwell, who was a doctor and one of the few survivors, um, and then in Pinner writes a really impressive book, actually, about Indian religion and Indian folk culture, knows that for centuries after centuries after centuries, 
um, folk inoculators had actually gone round Indian village, Brahmins. And he takes this very seriously. It's the first account we have of Ayurvedic medicine and medical practice akin to that. So there is a kind of golden age before the martinets of institutionally dug in British Empire in the 19th century, especially after the so-called Indian mutiny, who are extremely open to precisely the kind of things you're talking about. I'll give you one other example, then we'll must move on to another question. My other hero in the book is an extraordinary Italian um, doctor called uh, Angelo Gatti, um, who inoculates against smallpox in France. And Gatti saw something which was terribly heretical, that the physicians, in other words, the high-ups in the medical profession, had been prescribing for money, very elaborate regimen of diet, of exercise, or lack of exercise, or bedtime, before your inoculation and after your inoculation. The actual inoculation was left to the apothecaries and surgeons. And Gatti said, all of this is completely unnecessary. In fact, it's actually lining the pockets of physicians. And all that needs to happen is, he says very movingly, the best inoculators are mothers. You need the barest pimp subcutaneous. You don't want to jab into the muscle. You know, you're absolutely right. You need barest subcutaneous prick um, in order to successfully engender the kind of smallpox that will not kill you or disfigure you. And it can be done by a mother to their children at night. So they won't even know they've been inoculated. We still don't have family vaccination. And there's actually no reason why we, in my view, we get into trouble. Just why say we really don't. quickly, sorry, the, the um, modern technology seems to be catching up to traditional wisdom with, <laughs> with, with, with the micro. In, in many the, respects, the, I think so. Yeah. The microbiome and the, the idea of the second brain. As, yes. As it, but yes. Um, thank you yes, very, that's very right. much. That's right. Thank you very much. Um, can we give it to this, this young man in the front? Thanks. Hello. Um, Hi. Is it <laughs> Thank you. Um, I wonder how much uh, how much you had to research to get uh, compile this book. Was it very hard? Mm. Because I haven't even heard of the of I forgot his name. <laughs> uh, the physicist. Hafkin. Yeah, well, Hafkin. Yes. What's your name? John. Sorry. John. Well, I tell you, John, that was one thing lockdown did. You know, um, <laughs> there was uh, not a whole lot of gadding about, which would be my, <laughs> no, my normal style of life, as Gavito knows. And so I, read, I tell you, but you raise a very good point, because one of the things which I didn't say was that the book I was working on about, you know, national sports and music and so on, I felt I kind of knew that stuff, not as much as I ought to do, but I felt I knew that stuff already. And I, I'm sure a lot of you felt this. I wanted to use the lockdown to learn something new. I wanted to go back to being a student, really. And again, it helped that my wife encouraged me and told me when I was being an idiot and didn't understand. <laughs> I started to you know, subscribe to um, science and to The Lancet and things like that. And if there was something that was really, obviously, ridiculously hard for me to understand, I didn't go any further. Um, but it was very, very, for an old person in Giza, you know, it was very exciting to feel I was actually, it was like mastering, trying to master a new language or something. So I thought, well, I might, this book might never happen or it won't, but wow, am I learning something I really need to know about? So that keeps you up at night in a really good way, actually. Do you read, do you read at night under the sheets? I used to do that. Just get told off for that. I would. I would. You know, I don't think you're that old. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Thank you, John. Thank you. <laughs> Can I adopt you? you know, <laughs> is that your dad? <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, well. Should we, can, can we have this lady here, over here? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I was just wondering, as a historian writing this book, what did you learn about how they dealt with people who denied all these diseases for so long? Yeah. And what lessons can we take forward with this? Well, 
Yeah, that's such a good question. It's so important now. Um, I'm pausing because it's so... Um, you know, persuasion does work. I mean, you know, the um, vaccination, cowpox, in, 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 were, um, was successful um, through, through Jenner. Um, and uh, human inoculation, the inoculation that Mary Wortley Montague did, um, becomes widely accepted by the sort of 1750s. And as I say, it's a whole other subject. Um, very clever family called the Suttons actually make it available to farmers and farm labourers, particularly in East Anglia, and uh, because it, you know, it, 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 they also make it, you know, they offer terms which aren't exorbitant for these absurd preparations and lotions and tonics and so on. So it was possible, but mostly, mostly you have to do it by going at it, um, you know, by explanation, really. And, and the reason why I'm, I'm pausing and stumbling and sighing and all the rest of it is, of course, you know, I live most of the time in America. And um, what's extremely dispiriting, there's a chapter at the end which deals with the demonization of Dr. Anthony Fauci, who presided over the National Institute of Allergies and Infectious Diseases. And he is being, you know, I mean, it's a, it's a Republican thing in Congress now to want to criminally prosecute him. It's extraordinary um, for um, what they say is, you know, completely wrongly um, providing money to the Institute of Virology in Wuhan and thereby causing a lab leak. One very right-wing television commentator called Tucker Carlson said, oh, so the man who is supposed to have saved us from COVID turns out having created COVID in the first place. Which is a shocking, terrifying, awful, defamatory thing to say. So, you, you know, it, it, it's part of a larger question, really. How do you disabuse and disenchant people, really, of something... Um, you just really have to keep at it. You have to fly the banner of knowledge as often and as clearly and as demonstratively as, as it takes. And I think also it helps in the case of... I mean, terrible things have happened. For example, the rate of child vaccination against measles and mumps um, has catastrophically fallen um, as a result of the so-called health freedom movement um, in both this country and America, which is an awful thing. So you, I, I suppose you just have to kind of raise your voice and try not to make people who are gripped by vaccination conspiracy theories not talk down to them, to actually take time to try and persuade them, not make them feel like wicked or idiotic people, really. And um, we're not altogether succeeding at that. It's worse in America, much worse than here. Thanks. Um, that was, I mean, the, the history of medicine, social history is wonderful, and the history of medicine is so human. But um, one of, one of my favorite places is the um, London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Right. Some of the stuff that, that, that they do in there and the history. And something that I learned there a few years ago, that in order to get vaccine out to the Raj when there were no refrigerators, they would take children off the streets, little urchin children off the streets of London, and you know, take them on the ship and one at a time inject them with the smallpox and the thing would get pussy and then they'd give it to another kid and then they'd give it to another. And that's how they kept mm. the vaccine alive until they could get it to the wealthy people in the Raj in India. Which vaccine are we talking about? Um, because was, actually, you know... It wasn't, being... a, it wasn't a magazine. It was, it was the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Right, Medicine. right. No, no, no. Which vaccine? Sorry. Oh, which vac the, oh I'm sorry, yeah. the smallpox. I'm sorry, I misunderstood you. Oh, the, smallpox. The smallpox. Okay. And, and well, that I could have been the learned, case, yeah. You know, that, and nobody that, knows what happened to those children yeah. once they got taken There is a lot of folklore. I, I'm not saying it's wrong at all. Um, but, but I, uh, yeah, that, that could indeed have happened. This story is about 
the opposite happening, mm. is of the vaccines actually being created yeah. in India itself. Yeah, it was so just a bit later. <laughs> Um, but it, yeah. So you're talking about the early 19th century or the yeah. late 18th century? Yeah. I suppose that could have happened. Yeah. yeah. The things that that were that were going on. Your book sounds wonderful. I wish I'd bought it when I was out there, or stand, you know, waiting for the. I think the there are. To are there not going to be copies? Lots yeah, there are copies. copies. Lots so of copies. Nice. <laughs> yeah, um, so you're not let off the we've, hook. Sorry. We've only got <laughs> we've got a couple of questions. There's a. Oh yeah here. Yes. Let's let's do this side. We haven't done any on this side. Just there. Thank you. Uh, hi. So I, I've heard of your work in history with art history and now with, 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 with politics. <laughs> that was the other Simon Shana, actually. Yeah. And so, so what I'm interested in is what was, what was different for you as a researcher mm. for investigating medical history that might right. be different than, say, I don't know, art history or politics? <laughs> what did, I know you obviously learned a lot about a new field, but the actual research of finding stuff out and uh, d double checking things and yeah what, do you have any, was there any difference for you or well first of all i had to do uh, microbiology for dummies there's no doubt you know again with you buy that wife book? checking no <laughs> that, but i i thought for example there's um, when hafkin first demonstrates the cholera vaccine in paris in that summer in july 1892 um, fortunately, Hankin not only is watching it and is going to be vaccinated himself, but he writes a very, very detailed account of the scientific process which produces a stable, vital, in other words, pretty so-called exalté, as the Astrid Pasteur said, um, an intensified... So I needed to understand, I felt I absolutely needed to understand, as it were, the nuts and bolts of the experimental process. That's why, you know, the answer to people who want to do this is marry a scientist, you know, actually. <laughs> and because every lunch, really, I'd say, I've got this right, Jenny, and you say, yes, no. And um, so I needed to really do that before I even made a move about thinking about the, the cultural and social history, which I for, or the relationship between Hafkin or Yassin or Gatti and the people around them. But it was interesting, actually, Ginny said to me, he said, and I, I said something of the kind, you know, I'm having a wonderful time, but I, you know, I am essentially such a kind of novice at this. And so that was exciting. She said, well, you know, when you were writing your book about Rembrandt, remember you collected, which I did, 17th century pigments. And um, actually, I did that. You can. Cinnabar is actually very dangerous. And I made my own tin lead white, actually. Um, also quite dangerous through your small children around. But I absolutely wanted to describe the kind of innards of the Jewish bride in particular, the texture and the extraordinary sort of substrata that Rembrandt lays on. I wanted to see how um, old-fashioned old pigments would behave on canvas and, and also how acid would work on an etching plate and so on. So I think really I'm a terrible, you know, I'm not a really practical person. The, the only really detailed practical thing I do is cook. I'm obsessive, compulsive cook. But it is that sort of figuring out, you know, the chemistry of everything, really. Even if I, and I'm hoping, I mean, that's why I gave the manuscript to wonderful Philip Ball, who used to be contributing, major contributing editor to Nature as well, to say, have I made any ridiculous, I'm sure there are, you know, there, there are some gaffes and blunders in there. But that for me was, it was crucial before I kind of simply swanned in and said, now I'm going to tell you the story of the politics and the cultural response to it. Um, have I missed anyone else on this side? I forgot my glasses. I think there's a gentleman there at the back. Thank you. Um, I'm really looking forward to um, seeing what fiction and drama tells the story of the pandemic we've all just lived through. I was Where wondering, are you? Sorry, I'm not got wave. Oh, there yeah. you are. Yes. Hi. I was Hello. wondering, yeah. are there any novels or plays that have told the story you're telling in this book well? Um, there is. Um, uh, well, you know, of course, there's Camus's Plague. Um, but, and there is, of course, we forget that Daniel Defoe, a Journal of a Plague Year, is a novel. In fact, he's in the void, which is, I think, the first first novel, isn't it? It's before Gulliver and for yeah, <laughs> panic there. Um, but it's um, it, so 
Uh, Journal of Plague Year, written by Defoe, was written at the time of this drive for statistics. And there was actually a man called John Grant, spelled G-R-A-U-N-T, who did a lot of extraordinary statistical work based on the mortality bills during the great plagues of the 17th century. Um, so it was very interesting that Defoe, who was so many things in so many different ways, propagandist, fiction writer, you know, um, decided to do that. The one I, I rather love, but it's really pretty terrifying book, is a French book, but it has been translated called Horseman on the Roof by Jean Giono, which is set in um, a, a violent cholera epidemic. And there is also, oh, yeah, um, uh, I mean, there were, you know, Boccaccio's Decameron, which I read, we, the young lady, uh, sort of naughty. We, um, yeah, I read that during when COVID hit. I, it's an incredible thing to read. It begins with an absolute terrifying description of, um, of the plague in Florence. Thucydides, in his history, the plague in Athens, we don't quite know what kind of plague it was, where society just comes apart massively. And in, um, oh, the Italian, I Promessi Sposi, um, Manzoni's book, which all Italian school children are forced to read and hate it, but it's actually a great novel um, about the nun of Monza and um, star-crossed lovers. That again, towards the end of the book of, oh, what's it translated as? The Betrothed, I suppose, I Promessi Sposi. That has an extraordinary description of the play hitting Milan in the 16th century. So that's your reading list. <laughs> it's the most depressing reading list. <laughs> um, on that note, uh, <laughs> I'd like to thank Simon. I'm sorry you didn't get to write your nationalism of sport and music. You know, but would you rather have written that one? No, this is a brilliant book and he will be signing copies outside. Um, so can we all thank him very much? <laughs>